Welcome to Elector Engineering Insights, the show that puts your engineering challenges to the industry's experts. I'm your host, Stuart Cording. If we are to become a greener society, it is not just enough to rip fossil fuels out of our daily lives. The electrical alternatives that will replace them need to deliver the highest possible efficiencies too. As a result, those involved in power conversion technology are continuously looking for ways to attain another percentage point of efficiency. Silicon MOSFETs and IGBTs have been the go-to component for power designers for decades. However, things are changing. With the introduction of wide band gap semiconductor solutions, silicon carbide or SIC and gallium nitride or GAN are changing the way power converters are built. To understand how we move from silicon to wide band gap alternatives and to learn what the core differences are, I'm joined by Anup Bala from United SIC, now Corvo, and Denis Macon from Yang, and Yang Zhao from InnoScience. So I'm just going to bring the guys in. Here we go. Oh. Hello. There we are. Hi. So Anup Bala, welcome to the show, first of all. Um, could you just uh, tell us a little bit more about United SIC in a couple of words? Yeah, United SIC has been around since uh, you know 1999 as a spin out from Rutgers. Did a lot of R&D in silicon carbide in the early days and became a, you know, transitioned into a product company around the around 2010 in that time frame. Uh, and in the last decade, you know, it has been known for its JFET and Cascode based products. Okay. Last October, we got United SIC got acquired by Corvo, and that's why you see United SIC is now Corvo. We okay. are part of their infrastructure and defense products group. Um, you know, there's a sister company there that does some analog ICs, so forming a new kind of product group to do power. And uh, what's your position at United SIC and your background? I'm, you know, I'm. Uh, a dyed in the wool power devices guy from the time I graduated in the mid 90s, long time. Worked on silicon for the first 15 years, low voltage, high voltage IGBTs, super junctions. And then since 2012, I've been doing silicon carbide at United Silicon Carbide. Um, and for, I'm the chief engineer for power devices for Corbo. Super, thanks very much. And now I'm going to move over to Dini from InnoScience. Maybe you could tell us a little bit of the InnoScience story. Yeah, indeed. So, hello, everybody. So, indeed, you know, science uh, started, let's say, at the end of 2015. And uh, from the very beginning, let's say, we focus on 18-inch gun on silicon. So, we are, we say, a newcomer in the Western world, but de facto, we are the largest IDM, the largest manufacturing manufacturer of 18-inch gun on silicon. So, whereas other people are focused on 6-inch, uh, we are the only one, let's say, that are today mass manufacturing 18-inch gallon silicon power devices. So last year we become international and uh, therefore okay. we are giving our device to the world. Super. And what's your role at uh, InnoScience? Yeah, so I'm the general manager of InnoScience Europe, uh, taking care of the customer in Europe and uh, making sure we're going to serve them uh, well with gun technology. Smashing. Yep. And Yang Zhao, you also joined us from InnoScience. Can you tell us what your role is and background? Okay. Uh, uh, my, my role currently in InnoScience is the senior manager for product design and definition engineering. And I came from a uh, power supply background and I work, I've been working in the uh, uh, power supply industry for several years and also in the semiconductor industries, mainly focused on web and gap device. So I've been working in both uh, silicon carbide work and also gun natural work. Super. Well, thanks very much to you all. I shall be getting back to you shortly. I'm just going to share a little bit more background about the show. Now, while I have plenty of questions on SIC and GAN for my guests, this live show thrives on the questions that are troubling you. So regardless of where you're watching, you can post your questions and comments directly to us. Throughout the show, we'll do our best to get answers or guide you to resources that might help. And between the shows, you can also get in touch with me, Stuart Cording, directly via email or Twitter. So with all of that out of the way, I'd like to bring in um, Anup uh, from United SIC. Welcome back, Anup. Hi. So my first question, 
Power converters that I've looked at already regularly achieve 96% efficiencies, and I've heard that with SICK you might gain an extra 2%. Doesn't that mean that all that effort that you've been putting into SIC development the last last 10 years has, has been a waste of time? What do you say to that? <laughs> yeah, doesn't it makes it sound like it, right? I, I'll, I made a 1% improvement in efficiency. It was already so high. Now, I think the, you know, the big thing here is reducing power losses so you can make your system smaller, better, lighter, and do new things with it, right? And so when you look at it from that point of view, take a car, for instance, you know, the, the, the traction inverter in, uh, in, in a car, if it's a 200 kilowatt inverter and you save 1%, you're talking about saving 2,000 watts. 1% wow. may not sound like a lot, but 2,000 watts of heat removal from a little tiny inverter that you're trying to shrink, maybe put around the motor of a car, that's a big deal. Right, you can do new things, and and you know this this applies to all kinds of things, whether it's data centers or all kinds of power electronics. So maybe we start talking about how much power we save instead of how much efficiency we gain. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a very good point, and I think to understand that, one of the things that we need to maybe first discuss is so uh, the the differences between a, 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 a silicon carbide MOSFET and a, a silicon MOSFET or an IGB device, which is obviously the, the devices, the power devices that you're targeting to replace. So what are the key differences there? And um, and what are the benefits that uh, the, the development engineer, the power man, uh, power converter engineer is, is gaining? So let me see if I can share a picture that might help you guys visualize, you know, what the differences are between these devices and in particular also what then we make, you know, uh, let's see if I can figure this out. Share screen. Okay, this is pretty nice and well organized. Yeah. Okay. Tell me if you can see the screen, and then I'll point out what's what what we're talking about here. You know, I think a lot of the user base understands that, you know, a at the twelve hundred volt node, silicon IGBT is dominant. You know, there's a picture of a trench-based IGBT here on the that I'm pointing to in the, at the left, a picture of a silicon carbide MOSFET, and then a, sil a picture of a silicon carbide trench JFET, right? And when you use the IGBT, um, you know, the resistance, if, if we try to make a MOSFET at 1200 volt, it would have a very, very high resistance. Uh, this just comes from the fact that in silicon, because the critical field for breakdown is so low, you have to use a much thicker voltage supporting region and you have to um, dope it lightly, which means its resistance tends to be high. And to cut that resistance, the technique is, you know, you inject electrons and holes into, into that region so that it'll have a low resistance. But then once you do that, you know, in every switching cycle, you've got to move the charges in and out, right? Which ends up slowing down the IGBTs. So if you wanted to switch high voltage devices very quickly or losslessly, you know, th this is where wide band gap devices come in because with their high critical field, like 10 times higher critical field, you can theoretically have, you know, a 10 times thinner region to support the voltage like I'm showing here. It's called the drift layer. And then there's no need to inject carriers anymore. So you're just charging and discharging capacitances. And this allows these things, these devices to switch much faster. So that's the whole value proposition for wide band gap devices. And the trench JFETs, you know, that we make, are used in cascode form to kind of do the same thing. So we'll talk more about that later. But the key point I'm making is they switch a lot faster. And so yeah, we're gonna yeah. get into, well, that's all good, but they also create a bunch of problems for people when they switch a lot faster. And then this other point that people get, who especially the people focused on traction inverters, is that, well, then the IGBT has a knee to its conduction characteristic. You know, you have to first turn a PN junction on before it'll carry any current at all compared to a MOSFET, which is linear. It's like a resistor through the origin. Yeah. And so if you're operating at modest currents, which in an EV, for example, in the traction inverter, you, you are most of the time. Many applications are like that. You know, you're, you don't need to waste all of this conduction voltage drop. Because that's just dissipation in the power switch. But I think the main thing you'll be interested in discussing later is, you know, well, OK, it switches fast. So how do you handle all of that fast switching? And it's kind of, uh, this is another picture of what happens at the lower voltage node, where the main dominant device in the market today is the silicon superjunction. 
then your guests, your other guests will talk about gallium nitride hemp devices, which are very fast switching white band gap devices. And there's trench MOSFETs and planar MOSFETs out there uh, based on made out of silicon carbide and then our technology, right? And in a little while, I'll talk, explain, you know, why we chose this technology. It's fundamentally because it allows you to make the smallest silicon carbide chip for a given resistance, which then cuts its capacitance, which then allows it in a casco to switch very, very fast, right? And so fast yeah. switching may be good for power losses, but we'll talk more about, you know, then what challenges people face when they try to use it. So when I'm uh, specifying or, or selecting a, a silicon MOSFET or maybe an IGBT, I have mm -hmm. certain sort of parasitic parameters that I have to consider. Yeah. Um, with, with a MOSFET, one of the things I'm going to be looking at is probably the RDS on in order to minimize the, the, the on resistance. Um, with, a, with an IGBT, it's more the, the, I think it's the voltage drop over the, the collector emitter that's, that's sort of my concern, which is an equivalent resistance almost. Um, how, how do SICK MOSFETs stack up with, with those para parasitic parameters that are so important to me with, with older, the, sort of, uh, the previous silicon technology, such as also the, the, the capacitances on the inputs and outputs? Yeah, so I think, you know, if you want to answer the question about resistances first, um, at this point, you know, silicon technology is pretty amazingly good because, you know, I have this chart here, which I, I use to track the breakdown voltage rating of parts and what resistance they might deliver if I had one centimeter square of that chip size available to me. And, you know, we, th this is a line that represents the theoretically best you can, uh, number you can achieve with basic device structures in sil silicon. But because silicon uses a superjunction technique, it's now well below that limit. These, these two stars represent silicon devices. So it's at the 650, in the 650 volt class, you know, they're down near 7 milliohm per centimeter square. So one centimeter square of chip would give you a 7 milliohm device. The, these yellow dots represent some of the best GAN devices. These black ones represent some of the best silicon carbide MOSFETs. You can see they're making big jumps because this is a logarithmic scale. The silicon carbide devices, MOSFETs are down near 2. And some of our latest um, cascode-based technology is down near 0.7. Right? This is the generation four stuff that we launched a couple of years ago. And what this what this boils down to is that, you know, for a given targeted resistance, you can get a lot more dye on a wafer um, with the technology that brings you the lowest resistance per unit area. Then you can use this to fit it. You can use this to fit it into smaller packages and whatnot to cut inductances, which is part of switching fast. But, you know, one fundamental thing is that once you start having small chips and reducing capacitances, all these parts get extremely fast in the way they switch. And then you have to manage those parasitics. But the fundamental reason we are doing this is that it, it, it leads to more cost-effective devices, but more importantly, fundamentally, the capability to be very fast in switching. Then you can take it and do with it what you need. Sometimes mm -hmm. we have to just slow the devices down because of the challenges of fast switching. Yeah. Does that kind of answer some of your question? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, no, that's great. And so, um, yeah, in, in the, another sort of uh, area of, of interest is obviously then to understand which applications benefit the most from from mm. silicon carbide. Um, when 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 we look at um, maybe some of the marketing material that's that's um, shared by the semiconductor industry on on wide back and wide band gap devices. We get the feeling that uh, silicon carbide is, is very robust and maybe more appropriate for, for higher voltages, let's say above around 600, 650 volts, whereas a GAN is more suited to higher frequency switching, but maybe below 650 volts. Is, is, that, what, is that what you see in the, the way you advise engineers who, who are looking to benefit the most from SICK? So, yeah. You know, the, what, what I'd say is that gallium nitride, silicon devices are still quite popular, in fact, dominate the market. Uh, and then there is, of course, you know, we compete with silicon carbide MOSFETs a lot more than we do with gallium nitride devices, probably because of the type of split in applications that are being served. So I thought I'd give you the perspective on the kind of applications where we definitely see a lot of uh, uptake of our silicon carbide devices. And in most of these places, I think the dominant competitor 
is either a silicon device or a silicon carbide MOSFET for us these days. So, you know, you've heard all about the automotive. So the traction inverters, onboard chargers and DC-DC converters. This is the this is probably the biggest segment. But the, the segment that's the oldest for us is just regular battery chargers for forklifts, industrial automation, you know, those uh, robot robotic chargers in big warehouses, those kinds of applications, uh, including nowadays, <laughs> there's some wireless charging work for big commercial vehicles. IT infrastructure just basically means telecom base station rectifiers or you know server power supplies. This is an emerging and growing area because that totem pole PFC topology that eliminates the input diodes is really gaining quite a lot of traction now. It took a long time, but it's it's pretty it's gaining a lot of traction and it's used a lot in the onboard charger that same topology. And then then. I think so, so. You've always known that silicon carbide had a role to play in the renewable space, especially in PV. But yeah. we see a lot of uptake in the energy storage sector. So one common thing you'll observe here is that everything I'm talking about, you know, 1.5 kilowatts or so is the low end of power. Most of the stuff is, you know, 6.6 .6 kilowatts in OBCs, 11 kilowatt, 22 kilowatt, you know, high kilowatt space. Yeah. So maybe that's the reason you know, where the applications are being served by these high current discrete devices. And in the future, even higher volt, higher power applications served by a lot of modules. The last category is interesting, circuit protection. So we are seeing a lot of interest now with, uh, you know, there's so many different um, DC sources. There's a lot more interest now in making circuit breakers that are solid state, that right. don't arc, there's no arcing. And not just that, actually, even industrial breakers, normal AC breakers, there are specialized applications where being solid state may bring great benefit. So they're having technologies that give you very low on resistance in this 1200 volt class and so on is very useful because the circuit breakers carrying current all the time and wasting yeah. heat. So yeah. we are, these days we are trying to get we are trying to get into the sub million class in this in the in this space. So, you know, you can talk about resistances of the kind you get from two metal contacts touching each other. Yeah. They give you a sense. I think it's mostly we see the power area that we serve is relatively high. So maybe that's the kind of segment where you see more high current vertical silicon carbide devices. Yeah. And I think the, possibly a lot of the lateral GAN devices have, have already, you know, penetrated a lot in lower power. Definitely in, the, in your wall chargers. See them yeah. all the time. So when it comes to an application, um, if I if I have an existing design that is mo uh, silicon MOSFET or IGBT based, and I move that design to um, a six based solution, yeah. um, what what am I going to see in terms of improvements? Um, uh, in terms of say weight, volume, efficiency, what, what what should I be expecting to achieve? Right, that's a really great question. You know, if you uh, you know, if you're if you if you're designing a new system and you're trying to choose between an IGBT and a wide band gap device, you do a bottoms up job of doing the design for these fast switching devices. You can get quite a big big bang for your buck between if it's an IGBT between the conduction and the switching losses, right? I have yeah. some. I think I have somewhere down here maybe some a table of numbers I computed a long time ago, for you know what happens in a traction inverter. If you could ideally use, um, yeah, I don't have it handy, but you know, the it's a, it's a it's like a three x reduction in losses that's possible, power wow. losses that's possible if you use a wide gap band gap device because less switching loss, less conduction loss, right? And so that's if you do everything by the book. But typically, what happens if you are just trying to upgrade an existing design? You know, you have to deal with these very, very fast switching devices. I'm just showing a picture of how fast some of these devices switch. You know? And so the act of managing that and managing the EMI uh, means that depending on your constraints, you may have to give up on some of the performance benefits here. So this is where you know, the, the, this meeting that you're having is very pertinent. You know? It's just to find out, let's talk about what you can really do. It depends a lot on your constraints. If you're just upgrading an existing design doing a bottoms up new design, what are you willing to do? Yeah. How much? That's, 
I was going to say, that's, that's an in interesting point. So obviously over the years, um, if you attend any of the um, congresses, for example, that are looking at um, and investigating power converter and power inverter technologies, there's always a, a lot of research going on into different types of topologies for your power factor converter, for DC and, and AC to DC converters. Um, if, I'm, if I have an existing design, does it even make sense to just replace the silicon um, devices with silicon carbide or would it make more sense to really look at the topologies I'm using for each stage and, and maybe consider a redesign in order to, to really get all the benefit out? You know, ideally, if, if time to market was not a problem for you, you, you would go, I would recommend you do a bottoms up design and get the full benefit of, out of these parts that you're buying. Shrink your system, cut the cost, uh, make it more efficient and more robust, whatever thing. You even get more voltage margin for your for your products and cut their failure rates in the field. All kinds of things can be done. Yeah. But that's a choice that I find in the real world doesn't actually exist for most of our users because <laughs> they have they have projects they need to deliver quickly, projects for which they have platform developments for the future that have more time. So it's the whole mix. You know, we actually got started out because it's what we make is a cascoded device ultimately. And in that device, let me show you a quick little picture of what it is. You know, inside there's a specially designed silicon MOSFET with a five volt threshold that is switching this depletion mode JFET. So from the outside, you operate it like a three terminal device, right? So because the gate drive is ultimately, you know, all you need is zero to 10 volt to drive it, right? But it can be compatible with all other kinds of gate voltages uh, that you get, whether you're driving a silicon carbide MOSFET or an IGBT. So our generation one, one products, you know, many years ago, the first thing actually they did was replace IGBTs. Now it was not easy, even then, you had to put extremely large gate resistances and extra gate capacitances because, you know, you're replying, replacing a device that's far slower. But yeah, yeah. it was a thing that people did. Uh, and when that happened, they immediately got some efficiency benefit without making massive changes to their platform. But as the years have gone by, you know, there's more and more designs that are really all focused around wide band gap devices. So they are generally better done, better equipped to deal with the fast switching. And, you know, and so uh, there's a better chance of fully exploiting all the benefits that we are bringing here. Yeah. But still, you know, you saw, you saw the packages I, sh I showed you for the kind of products that dominate the actual business as we do it today. Many of these packages are really old school silicon packages. They have a lot of parasitic inductance. Yeah. Therefore, the devices are used and switched significantly slower than they would otherwise be. Right. So but this is what, you know, it's, it's just, it's an evolution in, in the design and practice in the world of power, power electronics. So a lot of these old packages are being used. They are now being used a lot faster than IGBTs used to be switched, but they're still the old packages. They do have a lot of inductance. So they bring, you know, they, they cause a lot of overshoots and whatnot because of the inductance. And so, you know, we, with our device structure, we often recommend small snubbers because they really help to tame under these extremely fast changes of current how much overshoot you get and how you can manage all this. Yeah. So there's a lot of education required for, well, switch it this way. In our case, you know, it's not so much the gate driver that's the problem because it's a casco. You know, it's very flexible on the gate drive side, even for DSAT protection. All of that just works like IGBTs. Right. The, the big thing is the casco is it's a bit harder to control the switching. So we use this, uh, we, we use this tiny surface mount snubbers that dissipate very little power, quarter watt, maximum half a watt to manage these waveforms and get it to all work because the devices people are still using come in highly inductive packages. Yeah, so it's good you're asking about these real world challenges because that's yeah. the situation. You raise a very interesting point because that's one of the challenges of the semiconductor industry. That um, one one of the sem semiconductor industry challenges is not just the development of new um, semiconductor devices, but also the, the packaging that goes with it as well. There's a, a lot of work that goes on 
to develop new types of packages. And, and that's a not always a purely an electrical task. It's also a mechanical task as well, isn't it? It needs to be um, pick and you need to be able to pick and place it. You need to be able to sol solder it. Uh, and it also needs to survive the, the challenges of, of the environment it's going to be put in. Is, yeah. is this another area that you're looking at at United SIC to, to uh, yes. you know, improve the package technology? All of us device suppliers in GAN, silicon carbide, are looking at better and better packages. One of the challenges we face in deploying new packages, I think you understand very well, is looking at how the supply situation has evolved in the world. People are afraid of packages that come from only one source. They, yeah. they, they, they really want this to be something they can get from multiple sources. And so the evolution of packaging standards you know, is, is, is um, it's unsatisfactory, it's kind of slow. The, there are not well-established standard packages that you can get from other people, every, but many suppliers in a standard footprint that you know, would make the user base much more comfortable with jumping to new technology. You know, you finish the design at the end of it, you have to manufacture it. So you've got yeah. to be able to convince your company that you've picked the best component within the constraints of actually being able to get it and manufacture it. Precisely. But the new so packages just... are all coming. They are somehow delayed, I think, by the lack of how long it takes, not the lack, lack of how long it takes us to agree on standards. Yeah. Now, I think that's always one, one of the biggest in, uh, challenges of the electronics industry is, is defining and agreeing on those standards. Uh, I don't think it matters if you're trying to define a wireless protocol or a, a new package or a new manufacturing process. Um, I think that's, that's what holds us back a lot of the time. I'm just going to turn now to our audience and have a quick look to see who's online today. So a quick hello to uh, H. Pratt. The, uh, I remember the name we saw uh, joined us last time and uh, Annie and Jenny as well joining us today. Uh, don't forget, if you've got any questions, uh, feel free to uh, pose them to us via YouTube, on LinkedIn, and also on Twitter using the hashtag ElectorEI for Elector Engineering Insights. I've just got one more question for you, Anup, before we um, take a look at GAN technology as a comparison. Um, one of the questions I had was regarding the manufacturing process. Um, obviously, we've, we're used to how silicon devices are made. We've got a nice silicon wafer as a starting point, and then we build up in layers on, on top of that. Are, are silicon carbide devices made from a silicon carbide uh, wafer, or is, you know, is the manufacturing process uh, different to how silicon devices are manufactured? You know, there's a lot of similarities. You know, it, you start with a single crystal silicon carbide wafer. It's just that that silicon carbide wafer comes from a bool, which is just this big compared to, <laughs> compared right. to a silicon one that is enormous. So that affects how much the starting material costs. It's much harder to create. And then the um, then it follows the same process. You grow an epitaxial layer on it, which is the layer that supports all the voltage in this device in a vertical current carrying device. Silicon guys, we do we did that in silicon. We do that in silicon carbide. It's much harder than silicon carbide because you do it instead of at a thousand C, you got to do it at fifteen fifty or sixteen hundred degrees Celsius. That's wow. above the melting point of silicon, and then it's prone to a lot more defects, and the material is much more imperfect compared to silicon. It's very good now, but you know it's evolved a lot, but it's still not silicon. Yeah. Then after that, it's got to go to the fab. And in the wafer factory, you know, if you look at a silicon carbide wafer fab, it looks just like a silicon wafer fab for the most part. It just has a few extra tools in it to assist with the fact that you've got to implant at high temperatures, you've got to anneal those implants at a very high temperature. But overall, it looks quite a lot like a silicon line. Might have some few specialized tools at the back end of it. Ultimately, some of the process steps in silicon carbide are lower in throughput than silicon, and therefore the wafers tend to cost more for that reason. At yeah. the end of it, though, like I described to you here, I showed you a picture where the, you know, the resistance that we get, you know, out of a centimeter square of chip size, you know, was this a chart? Yeah, is so much lower than silicon devices that you know we get so many more die per wafer if you're trying to target a certain resistance. That I think at this point we are able to be fairly competitive with superjunction type MOSFETs, despite the, despite the, uh, you know the high the higher cost of building silicon carbide. But the factories yeah. look, you know the, the the fundamental steps are rather similar. Factories 
that do the actual processing of the wafers look quite pretty much the same. Super. Well, thank you very much for all those insights, Anup. Now, now I'm going to um, go over to um, Denis from InnoScience. I'll just add you to our stream and um, take that out for you. So, and we'll come back to you later, Anup, with a, a few more questions. So, Denis, welcome to the show. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Yes. Now, we, we're just talking to Anup about SIC and uh, silicon carbide devices are called silicon carbide MOSFETs, which obviously relate similar back to the, the silicon, uh, silicon MOSFETs we're used to. But when I look at documentation about gallium nitride, we talk about gallium nitride transistors. Is, is that correct? That is correct. Actually, to be more precise, is a high electromobility transistor. So the magic of GAN is that you have a natural junction between argon and GAN, and you have a spontaneous formation of uh, an electron gas, which is uh, which own, let's say, very high mobility. And uh, all the benefit of GAN, let's say, is coming from that uh, high electron uh, mobility that you intrinsically have. So it's, it's a lateral device that uh, allow you, let's say, to switch fast, and it is a wideband GAN material. So it can handle, let's say, high voltage. And is is it, if I were able to look under a, a microscope and actually see it operating, does does the, the material inside the transistor actually turn into a gas during operation? Or is it is it just a, a, a term we use to describe the physics that's going on in ah, there? It's, it's really the factor, yeah, it's not that you see a gas, let's say, but it is the fact that you have a confinement of your channel and uh, is an electron gas is uh, exactly the channel of your device uh perhaps with the let me also do the trick that my colleague did uh if i show you just one a slide uh actually i have prepared it here so you see the magic you can see my screen right yeah so the magic is happening here on the heterojunction junction between argon and gun. You have the spontaneous formation of the two-dimensional electron gas. That is coming from that. Okay, so super. It's good to clarify that because it's um, it's just obviously a very different different functionality to a yes. typical silicon-based device. Yeah, and it's mean, interesting to clarify that. Yeah. Yeah, actually, it is similar to a silicon device because once you have your channel that is spontaneously formed. That's why naturally these devices are normally on. Then basically with your gate, you are able to deplete the channel locally here by modulating the gate and yeah. interrupt the conduction. So it just, let's say, a, is, is like a normal transistor, but the threshold normally is negative. Mm -hmm. uh, that is why there is a, this is what we have been engineering over the years is to have what we call normally off operation, where basically by doing some trick on the material, let's say, you're able to have a local depletion of your, in, so locally interrupt the two-dimensional electron gas, and therefore realizing normally off operation, let's say. Okay, so we've got the, we've got the, uh, the gas uh, element of, of GAN devices, and yeah. we've also got the, the, the normally, normally on, and you've made that change. What are the other differences that we would expect to um, see between a, a silicon MOSFET and a GAN transistor? Yeah, the, the other small difference, so if we look in the performance, we see the, uh, the capability of GAN of switching a higher frequency than silicon. And this one enable all new sort of uh, application or more like, let's say, increasing the power density of the converter. This is one. Uh, the other uh, big difference with respect to silicon is the apps is the very low reverse recovery uh, which i show you here uh, basically gun since you don't have a pn junction you don't have a reverse recovery current uh, which is uh, which is let's say causing uh, issue uh, in possible system uh, in terms of uh, power losses so this one i would say is the difference the other big difference that people need to get used to it uh, is on the gate voltage swing. Uh, normally, silicon MOSFET or even silicon carbon MOSFET, you can have a gate swing up to, let's say, plus uh, 20 volt, plus 15 volt. Uh, with GAN, normally you are limited to 6.5 volt, 7 volt. 
Uh, that's why there are uh, drivers made for gun. Uh, but right. other than that, let's say it's a better device, it's reach fast. Uh, you just need to know how to handle it. Super. Excellent. I'm going to bring in Yang Yao, Zhao at this point as well to talk a little sure. bit more uh, deeply on the on the technical side. Um, yeah. okay. So in, in terms of the, the, the parasitic elements of GAN, we, we touched on it earlier with, with MOSFETs. Um, obviously, we have our, uh, a gate charge um, on, on, on MOSFETs. Uh, there's the mm -hmm. RDS on. What sort of uh, elements of the GAN device data sheet am I going to be looking at and how do they com how do I compare them with what I understand from the silicon MOSFET world that I'm trying to replace? Okay, yeah, let me just also bring up uh, a slice to answer these questions. Okay. Now I'm uh, sharing this page. So basically, uh, this is a page that compares the parasitic parameters between the silicon and the GAN. And the, from this uh, left hand side figure, uh, I think one major difference between GAN and silicon is that, uh, as Denise said, the GAN doesn't have a PN junction. And as a result, there's no body doubt. And the major uh, impact for this difference is there's no reverse recovery. So the loss will be, uh, the turn loss will be different. And also without the reverse recovery raining, there will be a lower noise. So this is beneficial for, <clears throat> for Yamai using the kind of nitrate device. And also this table gave a, a, a quick comparison of some of the major parasitic parameters between the GAN on the first, uh, second column and the silicon on the third column. So I think it's very uh, obvious that the uh, gallium nitride device has much, much uh, smaller parasitic parameters such as the gate charge and input capacitance and output capacitance. And uh, uh, when it translate to translate into a system level performance, a smaller gate charge and input capacitance means a, a faster switching speed makes the uh, switching energy smaller. And also the smaller junction capacitors especially the energy or charge related junction capacitors makes it easy to achieve the ZVS for some of the soft switching uh, applications with a smaller loss. So this is the beneficial for both a hard switch uh, topologies using GAN and also the soft switching topology. So I think that's the uh, major benefit. Yeah. It's the smaller nope. parasitics. One of the points that we, we touched on just there with Denny and, and also yourself is on the gate driver itself. So um, we're, we're limited, I think, on the, the upper end of the, the gate voltage to six, seven volts or so on GAN devices. Mm -hmm. And I think, is, isn't there also a, a limitation on how negative you can go with the with the gate or the, the, um, the emitter, uh, sorry, the, 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 base, the base voltage of, of those devices? Yes, yes. I think uh, this table also gave a comparison of the uh, the gate voltage and the driving requirements uh, between an emo gallium nitride device and a silicon bus. So uh, we already uh, covered that for uh, the GAN. The uh, maximum continuous voltage range is from around minus six volt to uh, seven volts due to this uh, PGAN gate. And for silicon, it's a little bit wider range, basically minus plus 20 volts. So uh, um, I think it, it can be a, a view into two different perspectives. On one hand, uh, for the gallium nitride device, the uh, turn on voltage is much lower. You don't need to uh, drive it up to a 12 volt or 15 volt to fully turn on the channel as a silicon MOSFET does. And you just need to provide like five to six volts uh, uh, turn on voltage to fully turn on the, uh, the device. That will be a, a, a you know much smaller uh, driving loss associated with that uh, lower voltage, and also uh, as for the uh, negative voltage, basically you do need to uh, use a negative off voltage to uh, turn off the gate or to turn off the device. Basically, most of the application just use zero volt, and that will save the uh, the gate driver design complexities. You do need to yeah. generate a, a bipolar gate voltage. Just right. from zero volt to five volt or six volt. 
one of the things I heard about um, GAN transistors was that the the reliability over time could be compromised if you're not careful with the gate drive voltage. Is is that still the case today? Can I have long-term reliability issues if my gate voltage goes too negative too often? Uh, I think we can uh, answer this question from, again, two perspectives. So I think one perspective is that uh, you can have a, a, a good gate drive design. That's why we have some gate driver uh, design recommendations to plan the voltage to be not to go too negative. And uh, here shows a, a, a gate driver design examples or recommendations. Uh, you have uh, voltage dividers that you know, clamp the, uh, the gate voltage uh, during the turn on and turn off transitions. And also you have a zener out that clamps the voltage below the, uh, uh, the maximum rating to uh, protect the gate. So that's one perspective. The other perspective is that um, because you don't need to use the negative voltage as the silicon or silicon carbide device does, um, basically you can you don't need to go too negative uh, during the off state. You stay at zero and the, uh, the maximum negative voltage is minus six volt. So you have still some uh, margins between the maximum negative voltage and your off-state voltage. Now, one of the key important uh, discussion points around moving to these wideband gap devices, as we were talking earlier with silicon carbide, is um, considering new, new topologies. One of the areas where GAN has seen uh, some interest and, and lots of, um, let's say, um, design examples, which have come up regularly in, in my post box anyway, in my email account, are for uh, mobile phone chargers. When I, when I move to using GAN, um, do I also change the topology of my power factor converter and, and my AC-DC converter or DC-DC converter in, in those applications too, to, to really get the best out of what GAN can offer me? Yeah, I think this is a question that people you know, often ask. Uh, yeah, I think on one hand, definitely uh, the weapon gap device, especially the gallium nitride device, enable some of the uh, topologies that is uh, previously not possible using the silicon device. For example, uh, the uh, uh, PFC circuit, for any adapters or any chargers above 65 watts, uh, the uh, power factor correction circuit is required. And previously with the uh, silicon device, the dual boosts or bridge less PFC uh, is a very common uh, topology or a very conventional topology. Uh, because the silicon device has a, a large body down reverse recovery charge or reverse recovery uh, loss, therefore the totem pole PFC uh, with a simpler structure cannot be used. Right. But the gallium nitride device doesn't have a uh, reverse recovery charge. As a result, this is a new topology recently enabled by the uh, gallium nitride device in both the uh, adapters above 65 watts and also some other higher power applications like server PSU. So this is an example of a new topology enabled by the gallium nitride device. And also for some other chargers, I think you can still use the uh, uh, previous topologies, but again, also bring in some benefit like lower EMI loss, or I'm sorry, lower EMI spectrum, and also a better uh, uh, secondary side uh, 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 synchronous rectifier driving circuit. Okay. Now, when it comes to manufacturing gallium nitride devices, are we starting with a gallium nitride wafer, or is is the is the manufacturing process uh, somehow somehow different? Yeah, let me take that this is, up. Yeah. Right? yeah, thank you. So actually, you you could start from GAN substrate, but actually the beauty of GAN is that you can grow gallium nitride on top of silicon. Now, it's not just that you grow GAN on silicon; you have a lot of uh, engineering and buffers in between you grow GAN, uh, but de facto you can grow GAN on silicon. And the, the challenge, let's say, is the larger the wafer size, the higher the challenge. So uh, we have been doing that, uh, as I said, on 8 inch, uh, which is the largest wafer size available today. The other beauty of uh, GAN, and this is what we have been doing at IMEC, you know, I did my PhD at IMEC, and, um, is the fact that you can use a standard silicon process 
to manufacture GAN transistor. And therefore, you can take advantage of more than 40 years optimization done for the silicon manufacturing and apply directly with GAN uh, to GAN. And, and this one going to give you a spectacular throughput. And therefore, you, the end result is a cost-effective technology. Uh, that's it. And how does it look at the minute with the availability of, of GAN devices? Obviously, we, we've seen a lot about the semiconductor crisis. Um, there's endless numbers of semiconductor components like microcontrollers and A to D converters and all these sort of things in, in um, being, being delayed and un, unable to deliver. Uh, are, are, we, are we saying a similar situation in, in wide band gap or is the situation there a little bit more relaxed? I think the situation is overall uh, more relaxed. Um, don't want to speak for my colleague. What I can say from us is that since we control our own manufacturing, today the lead time of our GAN is between this is around 18 weeks. So rather quickly we can provide GAN device, much quickly, let's say, with respect, quicker than what you can do with silicon that is like 56 weeks. Yeah. Uh, in some cases I hear. So in that respect, I would say GAN is not uh, suffering for that. Actually, we are uh, I see some customer that reaching us out to use GAN as, um, don't want to say a replacement of silicon, but to change their system because they lack of silicon. And then really? they take advantage of uh, the GAN properties and better system. Whereas in the past, people were coming to us to get a better system. Uh, so the motivation was uh, different. And yeah. uh, this yeah. is a big opportunity for get people getting even more familiar with GAN. As I was speaking to Anup from United SIC, I was saying that often I get the feeling that um, SIC uh, SIC um, MOSFETs are typically used in, in higher voltage, uh, more robust, powerful, uh, high, high wattage applications, high power applications. Where do GAN uh, transistors typically get used and what sort of application spaces should we be looking out for, for more GAN usage in the future? Yeah. Um, from my side today, indeed, is more on the 650 volt application and below. Uh, we see two domain like uh, uh, 650 volt and also low voltage between 30 and 150 volt. Um, is still relatively low power, let's say, uh, but we are working in our portfolio to make available uh, much uh, device with lower iron and therefore that they can enable higher power applications. Uh, this is what I see application example that I see today is the quick charger uh, DC DC converter for data center where we are talking about 300 to 600 watt. Um, I'm also see gun using in lidar uh, and in other application and uh, in the future uh, I see gun also penetrating in the automotive first in the DC DC converter second in the OBC. And then one day, once we're going to have 1200 volt GAN device available, then I think that we could even start targeting more higher power application and uh, perhaps even the powertrain. Uh, of course, silicon carbide, they have a time advantage. They are already in that market. So it's going to take a little bit of time to, uh, to use GAN in the higher power application. I don't know, Young, if you want to add anything to what I said. Mm, no, I think you basically covered everything. I think, okay. yeah, as you said, <laughs> the adapter is the, uh, still the uh, the major focus target, but uh, more and more, I think we're going to a higher power, starting from the server power and then automotive, and eventually maybe uh, renewable energy and energy storage systems. Okay, I'm just going to bring in then Anup into the discussion um, so that we can have a, a bit of a, a broader discussion about wide band gap. Uh, my first question is actually to, I guess, from InnoScience. Uh, are you also seeing the same challenges with packaging for, for GAN uh, power devices? Yeah, what I would say that I do see the request of the, of the customer to try to have pin-to-pin -pin compatibility, dual source and etc. That's something that is highly appreciated by the customer, I would say. And, uh, and what I will see is that we need to, so today we are using actually standard packaging like DFN uh, because customer, they are familiar with that. So we try to ease the adoption of GAN. Uh, so we're gonna try also to leverage in the future double cool DFN or other 
packages that is going to allow us to get the better thermal dissipation. This is uh, what I can say. Yeah. And um, one of the big things coming up in the industry here in Europe, it's a very important event, is obviously the PCIM Europe. It's a trade show where everything to do with power conversion, green energy, green transportation is, is covered. I think uh, both of you are exhibiting at that show. Um, Denis, where, where is your stand going to be at the show? Yeah, our stand will be in the old seven, in the booth uh, 249. So we all, we're all really looking forward to see everybody in person. And we're going to have several demo from DC-DC converter, AC-DC power adapter. We have also uh, exciting, let's say, results on the project we have with the uh, Center of Excellence. So we are really looking forward to meet customers, meet partners, and show and discuss what they can do with GAN and how they can take advantage of GAN today. Sounds good. And Anup, to you as well, have, have you got a stand at uh, PCIM Europe? Yep, Hall 7, I believe, booth 406. That's I'm correct. Just looking at this information here. <laughs> I checked as well. <laughs> yep. And then we'll, we'll, do what, we'll, we'll do what Denis is doing and have the high power type demos that I've been talking about. And um, yes. just on, on, the, on that dis discussion of demos, if I'm a, a power engineer looking to get started with silicon carbide, what sort of um, evaluation kits or demo boards do you have available where I can maybe get started without having to maybe get to, um, into an application that's very, very high, high current or high voltage? Do you have some, some easy to use low voltage demonstrators or eval boards? Would you? I'll go first. I think yes, please. Most, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a range of demonstration circuitry and uh, information available. I think most people would typically start with a simple double pulse demo board for single or many parallel devices. In our case, paralleling is a big thing for high power, so they just you know get those and uh, use it to understand the basic switching characteristics in a in a well defined environment. Right, reproduce what we have in the lab get the same sorts of waveforms, gain some confidence and move on from there. Having said that, at this point, you know, we've been in the market long enough that I have to admit that some of our most sophisticated customers are probably better at doing this stuff than even we are. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to it's good to be at that point that, that you know some of the en engineers at the at these top companies they've they've they're very good at handling all of this stuff. Yeah, this I think we all have, have to admit there's a lot of creativity out there, isn't there? Really, there really is. Please, go ahead, Denis. And, 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 and uh, Yang, what's it look on your side for trying out GAN? Yeah, we have also a set of uh, demo board that a uh, customer can uh, take, especially a lot on the quick charger, but also LED driver, DC, DC converter. We also have a double pass evaluation board, as uh, uh, Anup said. And, uh, but as Anup said, there are a lot of customers that they know what they want and they know how to use it already. And uh, and that is, of course, is a, is a very good customer because you don't have to educate them and et cetera. But we are there to serve and to uh, to help anybody that wants to get familiar with GAN and uh, start using it. And we have a very strong team to support this, like the team of Young, for instance, uh, that can do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me just add one, one more comment. We also have... Uh many of the application notes and uh, documentations on our website, like the gate driver recommendations and also how to parallel devices. So those kind of white papers and documentations are not supplements of materials for the customers or users to understand. That's a great piece of advice. Thank, thanks yeah. very much for that. And also, I, I just, can I just interject one other thing? You know, yeah. the, uh, in, in, and those basic tools for learning the devices and switching yeah. them, some basic application circuits for totem pole, all that stuff. Uh, you know, we, you need to provide that as a supplier, but we've got a tool now on our website called the FetJet Calculator. It's a really easy to use tool where you select your topology, put in your inputs and your thermal constraints, and it just tells you. You know, you can select devices and then it's, it's just going to tell you how hot the device is going to get, how much power it's going to dissipate in the conduction and switching state. So it's a very quick selector for yeah. what's going to work and not going to work. Right. It takes it doesn't it's not a simulator. It just does all the calculations in the in the background so you can narrow down and not waste your time with a lot of different parts. 
That's, that's an interesting point as well that you mentioned with, with simulation. Um, Anup, are you seeing that um, power designers are, are increasingly turning to simulation tools in order to, uh, and, and sort of like these Monte Carlo um, type assessments or simulations of, of, of circuits in order to, to figure out really where to squeeze out that last um, half a percentage point of efficiency? Yeah, I mean, I, there's a range of, it just depends on the customer type you're working with. I do see, you know, the very sophisticated use of simulations now to find the most optimum design. Definitely, they some some people do that. Many cases are not like that, though. They're in, they're in a practical hurry to get something done yes. and released, yeah. you know. Right. So in that situation, this other thing I'm talking about is more useful. How can we quickly help you narrow down to the few okay. things that work? And then quickly help you get that evaluated so you can get on with it, right? And and and, and be and have a solution of the kind where you already have a reasonable understanding that when you switch this fast, how much EMI you're going to get in the gigahertz spectrum, and what's going to happen. So you have a chance of an actual design win success. You know this is what is most of what goes on. Okay. Yeah. And Denny Yang, uh, uh, do you also have some software tools available to complement the application notes and boards? Actually, uh, I think we also have some of our uh, internal tools to uh, calculate and simulate. And also we provide a spice model for our device for any customers you know, who want to uh, do some system level simulations. So that yes. means that I can use sort of standard um, spice um, circuit simulations um, just as I would do for a, a silicon based um, switcher switching technology. Because I think spice model is more uh, common platform. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have available in several other platforms as well in case customer is not using Spice, let's say. So, but I, I do share with Anuba the same uh, feeling that indeed we can provide model, people can model, can do things, but there is often the urgency of making it, let's say. So, yes. Yeah, super. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for your time. I'm just going to uh, say thank you to, to Anup from United SIC for your uh, inputs today. And again, from Denis and Yang also to sharing us all those insights regarding uh, gallium nitride switches. I'm just going uh, to um, leave you, uh, remove you from my system, say thanks very much, and uh, just turn back to our audience and provide you with a little bit of an outro to what we've learned today. So having spoken to our guests, it seems clear that if you're sick of IGBTs or you're looking for a performance GAN over silicon MOSFETs, apologies for the joke, you should be taking a look at wide band gap devices. Many thanks to today's guests. That's Anup Bala from United SIC, now Corvo, and Denis Macon and Yang Zhao from InnoScience. You've delivered some brilliant insights for us today. If you are hoping to visit the world's premier power exhibition, PCI PCIM Europe in Nuremberg next week, but you're unable to attend, there's no need to worry. I shall be going on the 10th of May to explore all the latest technologies and solutions for you on the trade show floor. So keep an eye out on the Elector TV channel and on YouTube for my insights. And if you want to see what else we've planned, you can also drop by the Elector Engineering Insights page at electormagazine.com slash elector hyphen engineering hyphen insights. So that wraps it up for today. Please like, subscribe and share wherever you're watching. And don't forget, if you'd like to join me as a guest, write me an email, drop me a tweet or reach out to me, Stuart Cording on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining us today. Stay in touch and don't forget to keep asking your engineering questions.